Hello, and welcome back to the channel, and to the fourth installment of the most popular series on this channel, Media Mondays, a show on the channel where I analyze, review, and write consumable content. From movies to music and everything in between, I'll talk about it all and put it on your screen. And at the end of every review, I'll rate the piece of media I'm covering as a meh, memorable, mediocre, a masterpiece, or a massive piece. Of shit. This will be done using a scale from 0 to 5, and I'll have 4 different categories that I'll rank, then average into an overall score. These categories are characters, story and plot, rewatchability, and the finale. Today's episode is one that I've had a lot of requests for, so I won't make the intro as long as I usually do, because it's time that I finally stop beating around the bush and make this video. So, get comfortable, grab your snacks, and hang on for this wild ride of a movie, because today is the day that I do my very best to interpret, analyze, and make sense of what was perhaps the most disturbing movie I had ever seen up to this point. Well, that's right. Today's Media Monday is all about... The Human Centipede. First Sequence. Before we officially begin this video, I do want you all to know that there are a lot of graphic things that happen in this movie, so treat this as a trigger warning in case you aren't comfortable with the following things. The mentions of death, sexual assault, drugging, torture, animal abuse, and probably a few other things that I forgot to mention. So if you want to click off now, I won't blame you. But for those of you that are still here, thank you for watching. This audience means the world to me, and I am glad I can share my thoughts on these disturbing matters with you. I actually watched this movie with a friend of mine, and she wrote down her notes on an index card for me. Unfortunately, she could not be here to record with me today, but I am better at conveying her thoughts than she is, so it's gonna be fine. Now then, with all that out of the way, let's begin. The Human Centipede is a movie written and directed by Thomas X. It came out in 2009 as an independent body horror film. According to him, the idea of the movie came from the joke that child molesters should have their mouths sewn to the butts of obese truck drivers, along with a few references to Nazi mad scientists at the time. And while this film, and by extension, its sequels were spawned from an innocent little one-off joke, the events of the series are neither innocent nor are they comical in the least. And I know you want to hear me explain the movie's plots and events, so here we go. The movie starts off with a man in his car looking at a picture of two Rottweilers, and then he looked at another image of the three dogs, but they are all lined up in a single pile line. And it wasn't until later in the film that we learned why this is so important. A truck driver comes out of his semi and decides to use the forest as a rest stop for a bit, but the man gets out of his car and shoots him in the back. Wow, this movie doesn't mess around, huh? Immediately after that scene, we are introduced to two girls in a hotel room named Jenny and Lindsay respectively, and they're both getting ready for an outing at a German nightclub after meeting a German man who invited them both to the club that night. While on the way over there, they take several wrong turns since there was no Google Maps for Germany at that time, and they end up lost in the forest. Oh yeah, by the way, this movie takes place in Germany if that wasn't clear already. But our main characters are lost in a forest? Check. Car has a flat tire that prevents them from leaving the area? Check. Phone has no signal and can't call for help? Check. Yeah, this can only go well for them. If anyone's seen any horror movie ever made, they know that those three things together only produce good outcomes. So while they wait in the car for someone to eventually ride by and assist them, a horny guy then rolls up next to them, and while the girls are trying to ask for help in English, he is telling them that he wants to smash, but in German. Once he drives away, they eventually decide to get out of the car and end up stumbling upon a house in the woods. As they walk towards the house, they pass a headstone, and that headstone may be important, but I'm sure this house and that headstone aren't related at all. When the girls knock on the door, we are reintroduced to the man from earlier, as he's the owner of the house, and he lets the girls inside the house, so that way they can be under the assumption that he has saved them from the rain and from being lost. The man leads them into the living room and asks them if they want something to drink while he offers to make a phone call to a car service company in the area to help them out. While the girls think that he is helping him, we, the audience, see that the man is actually faking a phone call in order to keep them here longer as he dissolves strange drug tablets in each of their glasses of water. This is also where we learn that his name is Dr. Hayter. Upon returning with the water and the false information that the car service company will be arriving shortly, the girls ask him if he lives with his wife, to which Dr. Hayter replies with, I don't like human beings. After Lindsay spills her water, Dr. Hyder gets upset with her, and the two girls tell him that they can just share one cup. It's okay. We can just share. I'm not sorry for making that joke, by the way. However, before they get the chance to do so, Jenny starts acting weird, and this is when Dr. Hyder casually tells him that he drugged her with something called Rolopnol, and makes sure that they both pass out in the living room. The next morning, he is seen with both their IDs and their personal documents before disposing of them. 
The girl and the trucker from the opening scene are in a medical room strapped to hospital beds. When Dr. Hyder comes in to check on them, and give them an update on the situation. So it turns out that he didn't actually die when he shot him, he just shot him with what was more than likely a tranquilizer dart. So, the situation is, the girls are going to live, but because the tissue matter of the trucker and the girls are incompatible, he has to die, and then he'll find a replacement for the trucker. And he tells him very matter-of-factly that it's nothing personal. Later that day, he comes back with an incapacitated Japanese man whose name is never stated in the movie, but it's Katsuro, by the way, if you ever stay long enough to watch the end credits. Now, Katsuro and the two girls are strapped to their beds as Dr. Hyder comes in and reveals the fact that he is an internationally known surgeon who deals with the cases of conjoined twins. And also, he states why he is keeping them alive and what he intends to do with them. You see, his entire job before this point was about separation, being able to split different types of twins from each other that were Siamese. However, now, he wants to bring about creation, not separation, and the creation of a Siamese triplet, or in other words, a human centipede. Something he has already done with his dogs, which we saw from the original picture, and now he is ready to move to human trials. Once Dr. Hyder has finished explaining the procedure and what he is trying to accomplish, he begins to inject them with a sedative one at a time to prepare them for the medical operation. But, Lindsay manages to escape before he gets her and locks herself in a room to get away from the mad doctor. To her surprise, he does get in the room by breaking a very large window and chases Lindsay into a pool room and traps her in the pool with nowhere to go. But, by some stroke of luck, the power goes out in the house and Dr. Hyder leaves the pool room to go see what had happened, which gives Lindsay another opportunity to make an escape. Lindsay goes back into the medical room and unties her friend Jenny, who had already been sedated by the doctor and is unconscious as a result, before grabbing her so she can carry her out of the house through the broken window and into the forest in order to escape Dr. Hyder. But it seems as if her luck has finally run out, as before she can even make it past the front yard, Dr. Hyder has already shot her in the back with a tranquilizer dart. After Lindsay's last ditch effort failed, Dr. Hyder sedates all three of them and begins the medical operation procedure as he turns them into the very first human centipede. Once the operation is complete, the ecstatic doctor eagerly awakens his creation and is very proud of himself and what he's done. Yeah! I did it! While the three victims of his experiment are understandably distressed and traumatized by their new, seemingly permanent situation. Now that Dr. Hyder finally has the successful human centipede he always wanted, he tests the usefulness of his creation by treating it and training it like it was a pet by doing things such as making them eat food out of a dog bowl, keeping them in a cage, and making them bring him his newspaper. During one of these training sessions, the Japanese victim, Katsuro, who is the front person of the human centipede, begins to feel the need to, um, well we're gonna call it going number two. And since Lindsay's mouth is sewn directly into his butt, then she'll be forced to swallow the excrement as her only source of food. And the same is doubly true for Jenny, who is the end piece of the human centipede. Wow, that two girls one cup reference I made is really becoming more and more accurate, huh? Later on in the day, while Dr. Hyder is swimming in the pool, they begin to make another attempt at an escape. But Hyder doesn't even seem to discourage them in the moment. Instead, he just gets out of the pool and mocks them for trying to escape because all four of them know how hopeless their situation is and that even if they do manage to escape, they will still be conjoined together as the human centipede, and so will be no one to find them in the middle of nowhere. Once he finishes demoralizing and belittling them with his taunts, he leads them into a room and proceeds to beat them for trying to escape again. After this beating, there was a checkup done by the doctor to test the vitals and the overall health of each of the three pieces of the human centipede, and, during this evaluation, it is revealed that Jenny, the end piece as she is referred to by Dr. Hyder, has an infection that makes her produce thick yellow pus from her pores and orifices, along with other sickly conditions. And, due to this infection, she is slowly dying as her health continues to deteriorate more and more. Dr. Hyder then tells Jenny that he will soon replace her, and that they should cherish the remaining time they have together before Jenny dies. But, before Dr. Hyder can go out and find a replacement for Jenny, he gets a call from the police that two detectives will be over to talk to the retired doctor. Hyder makes his way up the stairs from his basement laboratory to the front door of the house in order to meet the two detectives waiting there for him. Once he lets him inside, they begin to ask him questions regarding the whereabouts of several missing person cases, even going as far as to notify him that some of the vehicles they drove were last seen near his neighborhood, and that someone noted the accent of an American woman screaming for help. Dr. Hyder, unwavering in the face of these accusations, states that he has absolutely no idea what they are talking about and tells them that he is busy with research and he never leaves the house while giving them water with the same tablet drug dissolved in it. However, that didn't seem to work very well, 
so he goes down to his lab to get a syringe to inject him like he did with Lindsay early on in the movie. Upon his return, he is asked more questions and one of those questions is, what exactly is in the basement that he seems to keep going in and out of? A question to which he very matter-of-factly states that it's his torture chamber laboratory, and when they ask to see it, he tells them that they aren't allowed to see it without a warrant and that they should get it before they try to investigate any further. The detectives leave and tell Dr. Hyder that they will be back in 20 minutes with the warrant and search the property as they see fit. Assuming he has the situation under control, Dr. Hyder goes back down to his aptly named torture chamber laboratory, only to be attacked by Kassaro who, like the rest of the human centipede, has gotten loose from the operating table and is now on the move to escape from the doctor after the initial attack. Leaving Hyder for dead, the three make their way up the stairs and into the room that Lindsay once hid in when she first managed to escape the operating room during the sedation process, thinking that since Dr. Hyder had broken the giant glass window in order to get in, it would still be broken and they could use that to escape. Unfortunately for them, the doctor was already one step ahead of them and had the glass fixed days prior to this escape plan of theirs. Now, they need to break the glass all over again in order to finally get away from Dr. Hyder. Using a desk lamp on a nightstand, Katsura repeatedly bashes the tall glass window, leaving deeper and deeper cracks in the glass as it gets closer and closer to shattering. But, little do they know, the doctor is watching them from the corner of the doorway in the hall. Observing all that is taking place, and seeing just how far they will go before he needs to come and intervene. However, just when the glass is about to break, Katsu realizes that Dr. Hyder has been watching this whole time and turns to face him while picking up a sharp piece of glass. And, in a twist that I was not expecting at all, Katsuro states that he believes Dr. Hyder is like God. <laughs> or perhaps that God's will is within the deranged doctor and that he was brought to this house and put through these immoral acts as a punishment as if this was God's judgment on him for the selfish, shallow life that he had been living until this point. Katsuru then finishes his repentance and takes the sharp piece of glass he was holding to his neck to, um, reset his Roblox character. <coughs> I was surprised at that moment, but before that can be developed on more, the detectives have entered the house with their warrant and are now searching to find any incriminating evidence that Dr. Hyder may be involved in or linked to the missing person cases. And it's at this point, Hyder knows the jig is up for him, and he can't avoid this anymore. So, he hides in the pool room, waiting for the detectives to come to him so that he can finish them both. The detectives split up, and one of them uncovers the room where Katsura had passed away, along with Lindsay and Jenny, who are trying to reach out to the detective and call for help. But, before the detective can help them, he hears gunshots and follows the sound of the gunshots, which leads him to the pool room where he sees his partner, who is drugged by Dr. Hyder, dead in the water, and Hyder, backed into a corner with nowhere else to go. Hyder shoots the remaining detective several times, but the detective has enough life force left in him before he dies to fire a bullet directly into the doctor's head, killing him instantly as he dies from the same pool as his partner. Immediately after this, Jenny finally succumbs to her illness, and she too dies in the same room as Katsuro, and with no one else alive, it leaves Lindsay in the middle. Not just in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the house. In the middle of the room, but in the middle of the human centipede. And that's it. That's the human centipede. First sequence. And now that I've told you what the story is about, it's time for my ratings and remarks. Characters. To be quite honest, the characters aren't really much to write home about. Some of them literally don't even have names that you know until the end credits, but that's not to say they didn't bring anything to the table. Except for one character, and that is Jenny. Jenny seems to be the plot device that keeps a lot of the pieces going in this movie, and she doesn't have a personality outside of being a problem. Jenny didn't know the directions to the club that she was invited to, and it caused her and her friend Lindsay to get lost. Jenny complained about being lost, even though it was her fault because she messed up the directions. Jenny got drugged first by drinking water from a strange man, when she should know that she probably shouldn't be doing that, especially someone who looks like this. Jenny wasn't smart enough to try to undo her restraints so when Lindsay did escape, Lindsay had to go back and rescue Jenny from her medical table bed and carry her up the stairs because she was incapacitated due to the sedation. When it comes to problem characters, it's definitely Jenny. However, when it comes to characters that I like, I have to at least talk about Dr. Joseph Hyder. Dater Laser absolutely killed his role as the Mad Doctor and he carried this movie like Lindsay carried Jenny out the window. When I was watching this with my friend, 
she and I both wrote down in our notes that this man looks like an actual real life villain. And I love that about him because it just makes it so much easier to focus on our frustration as the audience on this man who is the greatest source of evil in the story. Everything from his mannerisms to his speech, his clothing, was great as far as villains go, especially for horror films, when the main antagonists have an impressive skill set but a lackluster overall character. He is imposing, captivating, and cunning in the best and worst ways possible. Lindsay was good, and Katsura was alright. Everyone else was kind of forgettable or literally didn't have a name. So, with all those things considered, I think that giving the character a 2.5 out of 5 is a fair score, especially since we only had 7 and 4 of those 7 characters were a part of the story from the majority of it. But, had it not been for Dater Laser as Dr. Hyder, I could honestly see this getting a 1 out of 5 for me as far as characters go, because his character made me want to see more of this movie, even though it was grotesque and disturbing, and that is honestly something that the sequel's villains lack, that Dr. Hyder has. There was just so much care given to his character that I'm going to go more in depth on in my final remarks, but for now, as far as characters go, that's going to be 2.5 out of 5 for me. Moving on to the story and plot, I realize that the plot of this movie is actually pretty simple. One wrong turn, and you end up at some crazy man's house. And that's kind of it. It's a very common horror trope that I think there is even a horror movie called Wrong Turn or something, because it's just that common. A story like that with its premise is pretty hard to mess up since it basically writes itself, and the only limit is the writer and the director's imagination. And of course also the budget. As far as the inner plot goes, a mad scientist tries to make a monstrosity and succeeds. He then needs to hide his creation from the prying eyes of those around him like law enforcement as not to arouse suspicion. I feel like there is a nod to the classic story of Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster here when it's described like that, but that's for you to interpret and perceive as you see fit. Since the goal was achieved very early on in the film, it's never a question of will he do it, but more of a question of what comes next, what now, where did they go from here. And even though that perspective of the story's plot wasn't very unique and pretty derivative, it wasn't something that I found boring due to Laser's captivating performance as the mad doctor Yusuf Hader, but if it was anyone else, I may have been a bit bored after a while, which is a problem I feel like the second movie very much suffers from. However, as far as the first movie goes, the only real issue I have with the pacing and consistency that myself and my friend had when we were watching this movie is that Lindsay should have picked up the phone and called someone as soon as she locked herself in the room, which the phone was right there by the way, it's not like we didn't see a phone, but perhaps she wasn't thinking straight or didn't know any German numbers to call when she was in a panic, maybe the phone cord was cut and we, the audience, didn't see that on screen. Whatever the reason was, it didn't make much sense to us, and while I was watching it with my friend, she said that if she was in Lindsay's position, she would have just ditched Jenny, and I kind of agree, since Jenny was literally dead weight by the end of the film. But overall, I think the story and plot got a 2.5 out of 5 for me, since I thought it was a decent job for the most part, but the fact that I enjoy it more for the way that Dr. Hyder behaved than the story on its own made it lose some points for me. Now, rewatchability. Is the Human Centipede first sequence worth rewatching? For me, this answer kind of depends on why you want to watch it or rewatch it and what kind of person you are going into the rewatch. I would definitely not recommend this for someone who can't handle the imagery shown in the film or those that just don't like the horror genre altogether. But if that's your cup of tea, then I'd say this is a great movie to rewatch with friends who also like this kind of stuff. I have seen this movie five times already, and each time I watched it, I was watching it with someone because I just feel like this is the type of movie that you can have a good time with on some twisted level with your friends who are into that kind of thing. Or just you can kind of watch it for the shock value and see their reactions with it, even if they are into that kind of thing but they haven't seen it either. When you rewatch this movie, there are a lot of things that you don't realize are setting up for future events or that have been put in place as warnings to us as the audience until you realize what's going on and it just makes the tension that much more intense. Even when you rewatch it and you know what's going to happen, knowing more of those things kind of just builds that tension more. It's like that thing that I believe Alfred Hitchcock said, where if you have someone sitting down at a table and then it explodes, but you don't know why, you're surprised, but there's no tension. However, if you show that there's a bomb with a timer under the table and then the seconds are slowly ticking down until it explodes, that makes the tension that much more higher because you know what's going on and you know what's about to happen, but you can't turn away from it because... It's just that entertaining and captivating. I feel like Human Centipede is a lot more complex of a movie than most people give it credit for. And if you enjoy that type of content, then it's worth a rewatch. 
as long as you're watching with friends. Do not watch this alone. Not because it's scary, but because watching it alone is lame. I really want to give the rewatchability at least a 4, but because of the caveats I placed on it, and for what reasons you should be rewatching it, and for with whom you need to be rewatching it with, the best score it'll get for me is a 3 out of 5, and I think that's pretty fair. And lastly, the finale. In most cases, a finale can either make or break a piece of media. So, let's see how well the ending of the human centipede for a sequence holds up for me. I won't even kid you all. I loved the finale very much, and I felt like it was a great ending to a story like Human Centipede. But, in order to understand why I enjoyed this ending so much, we need to take a look at the story by the name of I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. I don't know if you've heard of it, if you're into this kind of stuff, you probably have. But, you see, both characters that survive to the end in both stories are in a scenario where they're unable to move on their own, unable to do anything or change their circumstance due to what the master of their reality has done to them. And, in both instances, neither of them has a mouth, yet both of them must scream. Scream out in horror, scream out in pain, and scream out for help that will never come. In the case of Lindsay, she got the closest to escaping out of everyone else more times than not. But, when she was finally trapped in the pool, she no longer begged for her life as if she did before, but instead begged for her death. A swift and painless death that would have been seen as merciful compared to being turned into an abomination like the human centipede. And she knew that she no longer wanted to live in a world where Dr. Hayter was in control because that would truly be a fate worse than the most agonizing death to her. Which is why she begged and pleaded with him to just let her die in the pool. Even going as far as trying to drown herself in the water. But coming back up again because her body wouldn't grant her the wish that she desired the most in that instance. Just as death was the only way to escape from Am in the story I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream, it is also the only way to escape from the hell on earth that came from being subjugated to the will of Dr. Josef Heider. In the very end of the movie, everyone is dead. Everyone has finally been able to escape. Everyone except Lindsay. Lindsay can no longer move her body as her kneecaps have been cut. She cannot reach for the phone in the room as her body is conjoined to two others that have already been able to escape, and she has no mouth to scream for help. The last thing she saw was a police officer going to get the help that will never arrive for her. All the things that Lindsay had asked for had been stripped away from her, and now her own ability to escape is too far out of reach to be even considered. The bodies of her best friend and a complete stranger keep her from escaping. It is the same people that she tried to save time and time again that are now the reasons she herself cannot be saved, the reasons that she herself cannot escape. As the days go on, the bodies will break down and decompose, but until Lindsay's body runs out of strength, Lindsay will be alive to see it all, unable to do anything or watch in a room of death and decay until her final breath. However, this is not the only ending, because before Katsura was able to escape himself, he referred to the doctor as God. This is important to note because during the film, he denounces Hyder as anything superior to him. He tells him that he will regret doing these things to him, that he is no god but just a man like him. And yet, at the very end, it is Katsuro who has come to the revelation, if you will, that Dr. Hyder is the god that has come to judge him for his reckless and self-absorbed lifestyle. That the actions he has taken in his own life are the reason as to why he is before the doctor that he now sees as god and even refers to himself as an insect in the face of Dr. Hyder. The once arrogant man that would quite literally bite the hand that feeds him is now humbling himself in his final moments, accepting the judgment of God and repenting for his actions before tragically taking his own life. The way that I see it, the ending of The Human Centipede shows two different perspectives, those that accept that everything has a reason for happening, and those that are unable to see the reason or reach the truth. The ones that saw the doctor as a judge of their character, and the ones that saw him as nothing more than a sick man. Jenny was already told that she was ill and would soon die due to her infection, and Katsuro had expressed his remorse for his life and made peace with himself. Both of them were aware of their situation and understood what it meant to die, and while Lindsay had begged for death, she had been unable to do so on her own terms when attempting to drown herself, nor did she stay under the pool cover if that is what she truly desired. Perhaps it is because she simply was unable to understand her situation completely, or could not make peace with herself before she died, and refused to die because of it. Lindsay was the only one actively fighting 
resisting and attempting to escape multiple times throughout the duration of the film. And it is my theory that this nature of hers is what keeps her from the escape of life and the eternity that she shall spend with the decaying bodies of those around her who are simply able to accept what she could not, that there is no way out, and this indeed was the end. And speaking of the end, the finale gets a 5 out of 5 for me. I love it. All of these scores together give the human centipede a final average of 3.25 out of 5. A pretty mediocre movie in all honesty, but it does have a few memorable parts and a deeper message than I originally thought. While I was writing the script for this analysis, I had to constantly remind myself that when referring to the trio of victims, that I should be using their names or the they-them statements, rather than referring to them as it or just the human centipede. This movie does an excellent job of making you want to see them as something that isn't human anymore, and is just a creature without any independent thought beyond escape, when the reality is that they're actually three people who are all in this horrible situation together. Referring to them simply as the human centipede, or using that objective language the movie tries to instill in you is fine to use, gives the movie a win over you when you can just dismiss someone as no longer human, or just disregard them and kind of suspend your belief that they were a person with actual thoughts and emotions and all the other complex nature that comes with being a human. Even Katsuro says to Dr. Hyder that he feels as if he is no longer a person, but just a lowly creature like an insect, and yet he is attempting to grasp onto the remaining pieces of his humanity and trying to see if there is anything, anything that can remind him that he and the others are still really humans. Referring to the Doctor as God is perhaps not Katsuru saying he is really, literally God, but that he has fallen so far away from resembling anything human, both in the way that he lived his life and the way that he is in the moment, that even the mad doctor like Dr. Hyder is so superior to him that he may as well be his god. When it comes to things like these, I feel like there is always a deeper level of understanding that can be gleaned, and that's why I make my analysis videos and structure them the way that I do, because I want to share my thoughts and how I arrived at those conclusions with all of you so we can get to the same level of appreciation for those things that I have. There is so much more I want to say about Dr. Joseph Hyder. He was the best part of this movie for me, but this document is already more than 5,500 words long, and unfortunately I do not have the time to say all that I want to in this video and get it out by Monday. So, if you are interested in what I have to say about Dr. Hyder from The Human Centipede for a sequence, leave me a comment down below and let me know, and I will make it my next random rant video where I just go off on my tangent about why I enjoyed him so much as a character if you're really that interested in what I have to say. I got a lot of requests for this video specifically, and I hope that you all enjoyed it. These kind of videos where I get to take some time to look at the disturbing content of the world, and its movies and its shows and whatnot, and analyze it is honestly my favorite type of video to make, so I definitely know that I enjoyed this myself. I love dark and disturbing stuff like this, and I really enjoyed The Human Centipede, even if some people may not have enjoyed it to the same degree that I did. While my Media Mondays are objectively my most popular series, you all should check out my other stuff too. I do more than just reviews, you know? I think you might like it if you take a peek. However, that's where I'm going to leave off for now. Thank you for staying until the end. A big thank you to all 58 of the voices in my head for getting me to this point. And a huge thank you to Alexis for watching this movie with me when I know you had no idea what the fuck was going on the entire time. Tell me what you thought about this video and what you want to see me talk about next time. But, until that next time arrives, I'm Invisible Bill. And that's all for my spill. Like, comment, hit subscribe, you'll never know when, but I'll see you next time.